Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the time. Thank you for the applause. I wasn't expecting that. I thought I'd see people start walking out the doors once uh, it was announced who was speaking. Uh, it is a pleasure. Uh, I had Gordon. Gordon unexpectedly did that intro in the 8 a.m. service, and I thought maybe he was looking at my paper because he pretty much went through my intro of everything that I had written down. It was like the first eight minutes of my, uh, of my message. So I had to kind of gather things. He was like, what else, did I, what else have I done here? Uh, so he did mention some things, and I will highlight one of the other items that wasn't mentioned. It was in 2008. I actually won a pie-eating contest uh, my first year at FCF uh, against a guy who was like the three-time defending champion. So things started looking up after that. Um, that's probably one of my, my highlights. And you know, the first service, I did say I'd never preached before. Uh, and at FCF, I haven't, but then I realized when we went to Haiti in 2013, I did uh, give a message down there. Uh, obviously, they speak in Creole, so it was translated. Uh, so I would say things, and Pastor Luke would probably say better things uh, in Creole. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people came forward afterwards. Like, a lot, I was like, wow, that must have been a great message. And then and Dave Blaze, you know, we were talking to us. I was like, yeah, they pretty much come up. They, there's an alt call all the time. Pretty much the same people come up all the time. So... <laughs> Uh, he kind of unexpectedly took the wind out of my sails. Uh, so it's been five years. I thought I'd give it another shot. All right. So, and I'm going to wave. Now the kids like to come up here and wave, right, to their parents. I'm going to wave my kids. Hi, Jeremiah. Hi, Olivia. And my suitable helper, Kimberly, is back there. Suitable helper, very appropriate for today's message. Thank you. To my wife, of course. All right. So, beginning to end, we've been in this sermon series for the past couple of weeks, several weeks. Uh, Gordon has kicked it off. Uh, Pastor Dave Glaze came in last week, and of course now it's my turn. And a lot of you are thinking, what is up with all these bald men giving messages? Uh, we are not, we have, we have no, nothing against people that have hair. We're, we are hair challenged, you understand that. But if you do have hair, it, you are eligible to speak up here. Just to make sure that's clear. Uh, so we've been looking at Genesis 1, and as Gordon said, you know, was, he was going to task me with Genesis 2, and, and looking at it, uh, since he knows I have a background or a, a passion for apologetics, if, if you're not familiar with apologetics, it's basically just a, a way to give a, you know, a defense for what we believe, the hope that we believe, you know, 1 Peter 3.15 and 16, call it out with gentleness and respect. You know, I, I have a passion to not only you know, share my faith, but also you know, to, to study it more, to know it more, so that I can share it effectively with people. And, uh, you know, he mentioned, why don't you, look, you know, look at Genesis 1 and 2 and talk about them with the two creation accounts. I was like, the what? And he's like, the two creation accounts. I was like, you mean talk about, like, how old the earth is? Is it, is it old or new? It's like, no, the two creation accounts. And then I was like, oh. So I acted like I knew what he was talking about. And I, and, um, I came home and I started reading. I was like, yes. Yes, okay, I get it. So when you read Genesis 1, you read Genesis 2, there's, you know, it does look like, hey, there, is there two creation accounts going on here? Did Moses write chapter 1 and kind of forget about what he said and then write it again in chapter 2? Was there another author? So that is really what my objective here is today, is to, to go through chapter 1, kind of look again at chapter, go through chapter 2, kind of look again at chapter 1, and then determine what is going on here. Is there a conflict, or is this actually complementary information as far as what we're reading in the two chapters? So what I'm going to do first, I know that Gordon usually has a stand, but I'm not going to do that today, and not because I really feel bad for you, but because the last time I did it, I forgot to tell people to sit down uh, during communion. And I'm going to read the whole chapter of chapter 2. So I don't want people getting mad at me and uh, turning me off you know, five minutes into it. So I'm going to read chapter 2 for you, and I'd like you to follow along, uh, whether it's in your Bible or your, your Bible app, and I'll be reading in, uh, uh, from the NIV version. So starting at verse 1 of chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, 
and there was no man to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. The aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gaishon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of the Ashur. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She, called, she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So may God add his blessing to the reading and understanding of his word. All right, so hopefully as you're reading through that, you started to, to go through, you're like, wow, that does kind of sound like Genesis 1. Uh, so one thing, again, to, to, to think about is the Bible. You know, it's, it's, it was written over a period of 1,500 plus years, 66 books, 40 plus different authors, you know, different styles, different different ways it was read, you know, different intentions. Uh, but we know all of it was not written to us directly, but it's all for us. So you have to take into account how long ago it was written, you know, the different ways it was interpreted. You know, we didn't get our first English copies of God's Word until, I think, the 15th or 16th century. Um, so obviously, at points, we have to rely on how the Scripture is interpreted. But above all, of course, you rely on the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us uh, through His Word. So, you know, you compare this to, I, comp I was trying to think, you know, in studying this, I was brought, it brought to mind uh, my grandfather, and he was a, a very heavy influence in my life, and, uh, you know, he passed in September of this past year, but one of the things we found uh, during his later years was this, this kind of this binder with this, like, thousands of pages in it, and it was it just said on the front, Ed Vaughn, 1929 to 2008. And so it had like this, his, basically his whole entire life, and it was all in chronological order. And uh, of course, I wanted to get to the 1977 and after, because I wanted to hear what he had to say about me and my life. And of course, there's a lot of things that I got to read, you know, as a, as a kid and, and things like that. I didn't really know good things. And as I got older, some not so good things that he, that he wrote, things that happened in my life, but he was always encouraging to me. But, you know, the point is, that book that he wrote, it was one author, you know, it was all in chronological order. It was really easy for me to figure out where to go. If I wanted to see stuff about Chad Vaughn, I'd just go to this section of the binder, and there I am. Of course, when we interpret scriptures, a little different because specifically with Genesis, where the original language is Hebrew, right? And then eventually it gets translated into other languages like uh, Greek, and then eventually it gets into the English, English language. And then we have many versions, like I have the NIV, some of you have the ESV, we have the NASB, we have the King James, the New King James. We have many different versions, and it's interpreted in different ways. So things to consider as you kind of go through the text. Now one thing that um, I want to go back to is, is Genesis 1, because uh, we've been talking about it for the past couple weeks. And I will admit, when 
I first got into Genesis, uh, you know, this deeper study and preparation. Uh, I don't know if I really had memorized the days of the week, what God did on each of those days. Now, I, I remembered it, obviously, day one was light. Day two, you know, the sky, the expanse. You know, once we got into day three, I started to be like, um, I think it was, you know, so I, you know, I had to brush up on that. So one of the things that was helpful to me, there was a chart, and if you have like a Zondervan study Bible like I have, you, you may have this chart, or if you've read any resources on Genesis 1, you may see this chart uh, that uh, has appeared in study Bibles. Now, I see that my t- sermon title's up there. I forgot to give you the name of my message, because uh, that's very important, right? With the beginning to end series, uh, the subtitle is conflicting or complementary, all right? Because that's really what we're trying to look at. Does chapter two conflict with chapter one or does it complement it? So um, hopefully by the end of this, you'll see that it definitely complements what we see in chapter one. So this chart that I, that I, I was going to say I created it, you know, Dave Glaze last week had his paper that he put up on here, this chart. I was going to say, hey, I actually created this, but I didn't. That's, it's out of a study Bible. Um, I definitely don't have that type of ability. Um, but it was helpful to me in just thinking overall about Genesis 1 and the creation days uh, because you have the left side, you have the days of forming. So in day one, you know, after God spoke in the beginning, you know, then we have on day one, we have light. And if you look across to the side where it says days of feeling, then we have lights where the expanse, where the, uh, they were created in the sky for the signs, for the seasons, so that man could know time and, and to understand, you know, what season was coming up. So there's a correlation. You know, day two, you have the, the sky and the seas, and then day five, the living creatures, the birds, the sea creatures were created on that day. Uh, and then on the next slide, I think it just kind of finishes it out. But this was, this was helpful for me, and just to, just to think about the, the order in which God created things. Now, is it perfect? No. I mean, again, and, and we're not God, we're just interpreting it, but these are things that I've utilized to try to get a better understanding of uh, the actual creation days. So hopefully that's maybe something you can refer to at a later time. So we have the layout in Genesis 1, what happens on days 1 through 6. Now, if we move into chapter 2, uh, you know, as, as Dave pointed out last week, we started at verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their vast arrays. We know on the seventh day, God rested. And then you get into verse 4, and it says, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. And you're like, I thought we just heard that in chapter 1. But it's actually a significant statement that's being made there. Uh, so I'm going to really look at three things that may cause some to believe that chapter 2 seems like a kind of a repeat of chapter, chapter 1. The first one is the statement about the accounts of the heavens and the earth. The second one being uh, the discussion of plants. And then the third one about the animals. Because obviously these are three things that seem to be talked about in chapter 1. So why are we hitting them again in chapter 2? So I'll take first, we'll take first this account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. And the first thing I'll point out is the next sentence where it says, The Lord God made the earth and heavens. If you notice, Lord God, this is the first time Lord is actually introduced in Scripture. When, if you go back and look at Genesis 1 and all, the, and all the actions that God's taking, it says, And God said, and God said, and God said. Chapter 2, verse 4 is the first time we see the expression, the Lord God. So the, the significance of that is, of course, you have the God, you know, it's just the Trinity at that point, and he's, everything is being put into creation. And then we transition to verse 4 of chapter 2, the Lord God, you know, that expression Jehovah, which the Israelites used to identify their God. So for the first time, we see a, a description where there's a, a relationship, a connection between God and his people. So that's one clue that we're transitioning into something different. We're not just talking about creation in general. Now we're moving into what looks like the history of mankind. Another thing to point out is the way Genesis is laid out. Now we're so used to Genesis. Oh, how many chapters are in Genesis? Oh, there's 50. Okay. Well, when Moses wrote Genesis, he didn't, he didn't use chapters like we see them today. That was introduced very very later on, really, to help us navigate through, through Scripture with chapters and verses. 
But the way it was originally designed was actually, it was broken up into 10 sections or accounts. So in verse four, you see, uh, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. There are other examples, actually nine other examples. If you look at the scripture, you'll see where the word account or genealogies is used. So here's some listed up here uh, for you. You have Genesis 5, 1, the account of Adam's line. Uh, you can move on to chapter 6 with Noah, chapter 10, all the way through to chapter 37, where the last one would be for Jacob. So again, another clue that we are moving on to the, the subject of mankind, which was God's creation on sixth day, and, and not in an actual repeat of what was uh, discussed previously. All right, so one down. Okay? The accounts of the heavens and the earth. We think that can be explained. Now, the second one I wanted to talk about a little bit is the creation of the plants, uh, which is discussed uh, in verses 5 through 9. And no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground. So you read that, and you think, well, there, wait a minute, there's no plants yet? I thought that that happened on, uh, what, day three? So why, is, why are we saying now there are no plants? So again, I think we have to think about how the, you know, again, who the uh, recipient of this is, and this would be the people of Israel, right? We mentioned a couple weeks ago, the people of Israel wandering in the desert, they were actually the recipients uh, of the words of Genesis uh, given to them by Moses. So think about the audience, and you know, they lived in an area where there really was a dry season, and a wet season. And of course, man had to learn how to irrigate so that they could grow crops, uh, so that they could survive the dry season. So they had to learn to irrigate. Uh, so that's something that to take into account when you are reading this. Uh, another thing that, that stuck out to me as well is when he's describing the plants, it says, of the field. Okay, you have no shrub of the field or plants of the field had yet sprung up. So there's clues here that makes it seem like, okay, there's no real plant agriculture yet. Now, God has put plants on the earth, right? He told us that in day three, but there's no real farming or agriculture of it yet because man has not yet appeared on the scene. So that's one way that you could look at that uh, as a possible explanation as to why plants are described here. Uh, there's another thing as well that I'll get to that has to do along with the plants, but also something with the creation of the animals that may be helpful too. So let's move on to creation of the animals. That's mentioned in verse uh, 19. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. Okay. Well, I thought he already did that on the first part of day six. But you read this at first glance, it might seem like he's creating them again, but that has already happened, right? So the, the one thing that I'll point out here, and again, this is where you have different versions of the scripture, right? I have the NIV, and they've utilized uh, a translation where they use what's called a pluperfect tense. Uh, and you're like, what is that? If you're, an English, if you're an English major or you know English, you probably already know that. I'll be honest, I really didn't until prior to studying this. But uh, pluperfect tense is basically utilizing the word, in this case, using the word had. So... Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and the bursts of birds of the air. So what is the pluperfect tense? What does it do? So if you think about trying to describe something, let's say Chad bought a car. He brought it home, he built a garage, and he put the car in the garage. You say it like that, it sounds like, oh, well, that, that was a lot of activity there at once. He bought a car, he brought it home, he built a garage, and he put the car in the garage. But if you utilize like the pluperfect tense uh, and use had, you, then you go, Chad bought a car, he brought it home, he, he put it into the garage that he had built, right? It, it gives it a better explanation that the garage was already there and he just put the car into the garage that he had already built. So it, it gives us that, uh, not just the past tense, but the, the past before the past, so to speak. So, and you also see that um, you know, in other sections as well, like in, in verse 8, where it says, Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden. So the garden sounds like the garden was already there, right? When he's getting ready to create man from the dust. So that keyword had, plouffe perfect, is, 
is a good thing to, to look at when you're studying. You know, the, the challenges, what I've learned with the Hebrews, they didn't really have a way to utilize pluperfect tense, so it's up to the people that, that interpret the text to determine when it should be used, when it shouldn't. And of course, again, we need to rely on the Holy Spirit to guide us through that as well. So those are the three things that I thought, okay, that could be challenging, you know, to, to kind of confuse me to think, why does it seem like there's another account of creation? But I think we can work through those. So what else do we see uh, in Genesis 2 that tells us that this is actually complementing or a, a closer look at what has happened uh, during the acts of creation? I think if we look at verse 8, we have the first thing. Uh, we have the description of the garden, right? Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed, right? So the man has been formed. Verse 7 tells us how that happens, right? Genesis 1 doesn't tell us how man was created. It just says he made man and woman in his own image, but we don't have the how. Now we look at chapter 2, we have a little bit of a closer look. Verse 7, the Lord God had formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. So that's how it happened, from dust. Now, if you're like me, I have this habit. People say stuff, immediately like songs or like movie lines pop into my head. So I don't know what comes in your mind when uh, you think of man being formed from dust, but there's really, there was one song that came to my mind. What is it? Yes, <laughs> dust in the wind, right? All we are is dust in the wind until God you know, makes us into his image. And I sometimes think it's funny how, you know, secular artists, secular artists they, they come up with words and stuff, and they, they really don't want to share anything about the gospel or about the Bible, but they actually do. They teach us things, and that's all we are is dust in the wind, according to the Kansas song from 1977, until God <laughs> breathes life into us. So we also have the introduction of the trees, right? We have the tree of life, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life, we know is mentioned later on in Scripture. We'll see it again in Revelation uh, as we are being restored. And then we have, of course, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And we know that this, right, is the focus of chapter 3, because this is where a decision is made. There's one thing I noticed, though, uh, about this tree in the garden. We have the two trees, the tree of life, which... God says you can eat of any tree. He doesn't say don't eat of the tree of life. Actually, partake of the tree of life, right? And we don't ever hear if they do. But we have the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The thing I thought was interesting was he gives this command before Eve is actually created, it sounds like. So it looks like that Adam is the one that gets this information. Right? If you look at verse 17, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. He says it to Adam. I don't know if Eve's there yet. It's just funny because we were just talking about communication in our last wedding class, our, our last uh, our marriage class we just had here. We're talking about communication, and it was just making me think about what was it like, you know, when Adam was or when Eve was created. You know, you know, Adam was taking her on a tour of the garden. I was like, did he make it clear about what the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you know, what it was supposed to be? I, did he did he miss something? Because in the next chapter, she basically she tells the serpent that you can't touch it. So. I don't know if she misremembered uh, what information she was given or if uh, maybe Adam just maybe forgot everything. Maybe his focus on uh, increasing and multiplying didn't forget, you know, kind of forgot about some of the other things. I don't know. I'm just thinking from the current man's status, right? The status, just looking through the lens of today. And you just made me wonder what happened there. All right. So we have man comes on the scene. He's made from dust. All right. I think we got that. And then, of course, we have the creation of Eve, which we'll move to next. But before, before that, it's interesting what God says in verse 18. The Lord God said, It is not good for a man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper for him. And, of course, we know that this is mentioned, and then Adam, all the animals come before him. He gives them names. And then we get back to this again, this, this issue that we have. So the man gave names the livestock, the birds of the air, and the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So a couple of things, observations there that I made is, um, God says in verse 18, it is not good 
for man to be alone. It is not good. The key word being good, right? We just heard, we just sang a song, you are good. Right? We kept hearing that over and over again, good. And ver- in chapter one, we hear good. When God does something, creates something, he says, and it is good. Right? So the significance of that is, obviously it's from God. It is good. No one can do it like he can. And another, another aspect of that is the completion of that act. It's complete. So, if that's true, if we use the word complete and now go to verse 18 of chapter 2, think, okay, think again, good equals complete. So if we look at verse 18, not good would mean not complete. Okay? So again, this is where now we have Hollywood borrowing from Genesis because what famous line from a movie uses the word complete? You complete me. Right? So all they did in Jerry Maguire was borrow from, from Genesis. That's all they did. You complete me. And I think it makes sense, right? It is not good, right? If you think of complete in chapter one, completed, not good would mean not complete. So man for man, for man to be alone is not good, not complete. I will make a helper suitable for him. So the word helper, I know that's another, that can be another challenging word, especially for women. Uh, if I would come home and tell my, my wife every day, you're a wonderful helper, I don't know how much, she, how much of a thrill she gets out of that word, right? I could probably come up with a better term than helper. Uh, and again, this is just one of the, the challenges with translating you know, text from a long time ago into the English. We just don't have a great word, I guess, maybe to, to really give the power of what it means to be a suitable helper. Uh, you know, I'll give an example where this word, this Hebrew word, azir, is used for help or helping in other parts of Scripture. Right? The one verse or verses that stuck out was from Psalm 121. You probably know this, this, this verses because it's actually in a song. Psalm 121, 1 through 2, I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So again, the same idea of help is being used, and the helper is God in this case. So I would by no means want to demean the word suitable helper because the same description is used when we are calling on God as our helper, the maker of heavens and earth. So suitable helper is a, is a, very, a very great description, women. So whenever we call you suitable helpers, know that we mean it, all right? And men, when you say helper from now on, don't use helper in the same way because we have our kids, right? When our kids do chores and stuff, like, oh, my little helper, right? That's not what we mean, not that sense of help. We're talking about helpers and we can't survive without you, helper, right? There you go. All right. I was waiting for an amen, thank you. Timing was off, but it was good. All right, so then we move on to, you know, the first time where there's a surgery, whatever happened here, which is obviously a supernatural surgery, I guess. I'm not sure how you define it, but. So the Lord God caused the man to fall in a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. I don't know if any Mother's Day cards last week said that. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, but I think it could be be good. (laughs) But the significance of rib, right? It's like, did you ever think about why did God use the rib? How many bones are in the body? Like 206, 212, something like that. What's the significance of rib? So I showed the chart earlier you know, with God's creation and kind of how there seemed to be a pattern, you know, a form to it, you know, the days of forming, days of filling. I think God's very intentional with the part of the body that he uses to create Eve, if you think about it. And think of the other options, right? Let's say it wasn't the rib. Let's say he used the head. Let's say God created Eve from Adam's head. A lot of women are like, thank you, Lord. You did not create me from man's head because I would not want to be from there, right? <laughs> and then you have, let's say, another option. It could be the feet. 
how, how good does that sound? Well, we were made from my, my, my God's feet. You know, it doesn't really sound too good. Uh, but I, I think there's significance in looking at the alternatives, right? You think about head. If they're created from someone's head, that's kind of a sign of, okay, one would have authority over the other, right? You think about the feet. If they're created from the feet, well, that would seem like, again, that the man's going to have authority because, hey, you were created from my feet, you know? But instead, created from the ribs, right? Where's the ribs? It's on the side, all right? It's not above, it's not below. It's right there on the side. So I think there's significance to that. When God, and you even, some translations may even say, they may not even fully, they may not even use the word rib, they may use side. I don't, I don't know, but that's the significance. It's not really about the part, it's about where the part comes from, right? <clears throat> so, and then, of course, Eve is here. Adam gives, expresses his, his love, his affection for her, calls her woman. So really, you know, compare this to what, that wedding we saw yesterday. That's nothing, right? The royal wedding yesterday, whatever that was, to people that will never be on the throne. And I, I don't even understand why, they, why it was a big deal. But that was, it was nice. They had that wedding. But that's nothing in comparison to this, right? Don't we all wish we could have witnessed this? This wedding, right? The first union of a man and a woman. Another thing that as I was going through this study, uh, I did find some information. My wife went to Bible college, so I, a lot of the material that she's put away, I get out and try to go through it and try to learn something, try to catch up to her. Um, but uh, I found this. So this chart, again, not something I created, not at all, but I found it in a book called the Pentateuch. Uh, and in it, it describes how there's a parallel or a type, a foreshadowing of this union between man and woman in Genesis 2 to Christ and the church, and which is described in Genesis 5, 22, and 23. So there were really seven points to it, um, and there's just a couple examples. I'm not going to read through every one, but I just want you to think about that, that type or that foreshadowing. Uh, this union is actually does symbolize the the eventual relationship between Christ and his church. So you think about Adam falling into a deep sleep, Christ died on the cross. The substance of Adam's body became his bride. Church is, the church is both the bride and the body of Christ. Adam and Eve are brought into union. If you want to go back, I didn't, I didn't memorize that, sorry. Adam and Eve are brought into union, Christ and the church to be united forever. And then you have the next slide, which you can see, that makes sense, right? There's a parallel between this union and the union that we see once Christ comes onto the scene and his bond or his union with the church. So, again, you know, for anyone who would think that women are, when you look at Scripture, women are just not looked at in the same way that men are, not on an equal, equal level. I think Genesis 2 tells us an entirely different story, that obviously women are equal, and without that union, union between a man and a woman, you know, we, can't, we can't be complete. All right, so that was really some of the things I want to talk about. As I, again, as I prepared for this message, and I practiced a couple times, it's funny, because I think last Saturday was like my first walkthrough, and I was in the basement with my kids. They, want, they wanted to see what this would look like. And uh, so they kind of sat through the first run of it, and I was like, what did you guys think? And uh, Olivia's like, well, it wasn't as good as Pastor Gordon. Um, <laughs> I was like, ugh. Then she's, she's really smart. She was really smart. <laughs> she was really smart, and she's like, but he does have a lot of practice, Dad. So she made a good recovery. Um, so, you know, think about how to close all this out. And last night was funny, too. We're praying. You know, my wife's got her hands on the kids, and we're praying that I'll survive this, and, and hopefully it'll do, go well. And, and, and Jeremiah's prayer, I love it. He's, he's like, and I pray that Daddy will not walk away. That was his prayer. That would just not walk off the stage. So, Jeremiah, thank you, son. I think your prayers are going to be answered. I survived. Um, but how do you close this? You know, because it's all, you know, talking about Genesis 2, we're talking about creation. How do I pull this together? How do I give you something to walk away with that's applicable to your lives? Um, and so I was going through all these things, and, and people get really creative. I've seen a lot of great closings. Um, and initially, I was thinking, you know, we sing, we sing these Big Daddy Weave songs called Overwhelmed. 
And uh, I, think, I think of those words, you know, um, I see the work of your hands, the galaxy spinning, a heavenly dance. And it's like, think about that in creation, like chapter one. And, uh, and then chapter, or chapter two, more going into man. And I think of the other Big Daddy Weave sto- a song called My Story. If I told you my story, and it's like, I can't do that because then I'm going to start singing. And someone's going to sing right after me. And I heard she's really good. Uh, so I don't even want to mess with that. So I, I kind of scratched that. And uh, I was really nervous about you know, how to close this out uh, because, I, again, I want it to be applicable. So I just finally gave in. I was, I've been reading some, obviously, various sources in preparation for this. And the one uh, source that I've been reading is a book called Seven Days That Divide the World, The Beginning According to Genesis and Science. It's written by a guy named John Lennox, who's a professor at Oxford University. He's a Christian. He's a mathematician. Uh, studied under uh, C.S. Lewis a little bit. Uh, his his uh, nephew and niece, you may know them, they're Kristen, Keith and Kristen Getty. They sing that song in Christ Alone. Uh, but he's a, he's a great apologist. If you've ever listened to Ravi Zacharias, sometimes he'll fill in for him. Uh, he's debated Richard Dawkins, and he has a great Irish voice. So my wife always talks about, you know, if she could picture a grandfather talking to her, it would be, it was, she would, he would sound like John Lennox. So I really appreciate this guy's work, and you know, I've always been wanting to read this book, and kind of preparing for this gave me a reason to do that. But I found something yesterday that I thought I would share, and it, it's really it's speaking about in regards to the Sabbath, but I really think it ties all this together uh, for what I've been trying to say, and it does it better than what I would do it. Um, so I'm going to read it to you. Jesus' invitation is clear, that rest comes when we are prepared to come to him and accept what he calls my yoke. That is, accept his authority and leadership. At the heart of Christianity is a willingness to trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and thereby receive forgiveness and peace with God. The problem is that in a world where achievement and merit count for so much, we human beings find it difficult to understand and accept that God's forgiveness and peace cannot be earned by our work, effort, or merit, but must be received as a free gift. And that, says the letter to the Hebrews, is where the Sabbath can help us. Not now at the level of resting one day in seven, but in understanding the principle that is involved. God did the work of creating the universe, and then he rested. We inherit a creation that we didn't work for, merit, or earn. In that sense, we rest in what God has done. Entering God's spiritual rest, receiving his forgiveness, salvation, and peace, proceeds in exactly the same way. God has completed the work on which salvation rests the death of Christ for human sin on the cross. In order to enter God's rest, we must rest on the work that Christ has done, not on the work we do. Paul makes this principle crystal clear. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but trusts him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. That's from Romans 4, 4 through 5. So you know, the point that I, what I got from all that is, yes, it is, it is great to, to study the scriptures, to study Genesis 1 and 2 and, and try to understand it, but we also have to rest in it as well, right? We know what's about to happen, right, in Genesis 3. We know what's coming. Uh, we have creation now, but we know the fall is right around the corner. And thankfully for us, it's not the end. It's only the beginning of being a new creation through Christ. So hopefully that's something that you can, you can dwell on. Now, I've, uh, I've done the questions for the week. For the, it's funny because I was just thinking about this, like do I have to answer my own questions this week for the, uh, f- for the sermon follow-up? Um, but hopefully you'll take the time, uh, not just this week, but every week, right? We have that insert in the bulletin. It's a great way to, to stay in touch with the scripture that, that's talked about on Sunday. I mean, let's face it, we can't, just come in here on Sundays, hear you know, 40 minutes, 45 minutes of, of a sermon or a message and then walk away and, and be filled and be ready. We need more than that. So you know, take this as an opportunity. As a, you know, I just do it normally as, as one question a day. I just treat it as a, a small devotional, read through the passage, answer a question, just kind of do that throughout the week. So if you are looking for a way to kind of get more tied in to, to what's being uh, shared on Sundays, I think it's a great way to do it. And with that, I'm just going to go ahead and close in prayer. And I think 
We're going, to be followed, we're going to follow that with a moment of special music. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the work that you have done. Thank you for what we have seen in your creation. Thank you that we can marvel at it, uh, especially a day like today where we've had a lot of rain, and now we really do celebrate Sunday, right? Because the sun is, is out there. It's made an appearance. But Lord, you are the true reason we celebrate this day you coming into this world to live for us, to live a perfect life, to die on the cross, to suffer, to bear the weight of our sin that only you, only you could carry. And then you came back to give us life through you. Thank you for that hope and truth. Thank you for your love. And and again, I just pray that the message today was uh, either encouraging or inspiring or just push people to, to examine your word a little bit more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.